Uh, Dan, Dan, uh, as I say, was a fraternity brother of mine, and, and uh, we weren't, many of us were not entirely sure what was going on upstairs with Dan in the first year or two. We were playing with the cross, and, but we weren't sure exactly, you know, took a lot of blows to the head playing that game, and, and uh, it wasn't until our senior year <coughs> when he got inducted into Phi Beta Kappa Honorary, we realized that there was a, quite a lot going on upstairs. <laughs> He graduated from Wesleyan with a degree in history and then went to the University of Wisconsin where he uh, uh, attained his PhD. And then from there he came back to Ohio Smart. I think he uh, started in Michigan, I believe. Is that right? Well, you were. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, well, I don't know. See, I thought so. Anyway, uh, came to the University of Akron, which when we were in school was Akron University, and was a member of the Ohio Athletic Conference. It's a little bigger school now. And then was a professor in the history department for up until the year 2000. And is it safe to say that your focus was on U.S. manufacturing and labor unions? Is that fairly accurate? It's published several books on, on those categories. And for those of you who think, well, maybe I've gotten into the, long, the wrong lecture, he's not unidimensional. Uh, he has other interests. And one of his other major interests is the outdoors. And uh, he's been uh, an active hiker, backpacker, camper, all around the country. And he and his wife have a goal of visiting all 50 national parks. Have you made it yet? Almost, getting close. He's also very active in the Sierra Club uh, and has had uh, positions of responsibility within that organization and of course that very interested in environmental issues. And sustainability as it relates to campus, college campuses, is a, is a, a way that is hopefully sweeping across the country and Ohio Wesleyan has a sustainability program. So Dan's going to talk about Sustainability and the Green Movement. When I, when I was here back in the 1960s, I was a history major, and so I only learned of old stuff. Um, to uh, help today, I have uh, recruited a, a genuine expert, Peter Shantz. Would you sign up, Pete? Uh, Peter is a, is a uh, Director of, it's, it's very elaborate, uh, fiscal plan, planning and operations here at Ohio Wesleyan. And he's been very much involved in, in the sustainability program here. I should add that, that uh, the head of that program is a man named uh, Sean Kinghorn. Uh, Sean cannot be here because he is in Haiti right now with a group of students, and they are applying some of the ideas that uh, they used here. Uh, to the operations of the, uh, of the uh, orphanage that they are working. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, sustainability on, on campus, on Ohio Wesleyan in particular, and we're going to do it very quickly so that you can rush out and jump into the golf cart <laughs> so you don't miss the uh, whatever it is that's going on over there. The sustainability movement is uh, popular and influential on college campuses these days. Uh, the term itself has a number of meanings and, and uh, some of them have been uh, Let me point out two things that are usually involved. One, it is an effort to improve efficiency uh, for the individual, for the institution. Um, maybe uh, if you've uh, had a lot of contact with nonprofit organizations, you know that most of them uh, don't are particularly interested in efficiency, especially in cutting costs and so on. Uh, unless there is some ideological veneer that goes along with it. In this particular case, yes, uh, sustainability has an implication of social responsibility, and that has appealed to a lot of college uh, uh, presidents and uh, the people the green, with the green eye shades who uh, take care of the money because uh, a lot of this efficiency uh, effort is money saving, so that has been a considerable appeal. 
But that, that doesn't explain the popularity. And I think there's another factor that I would call the, the lifestyle dimension. And this is what has attracted students. Uh, the idea is that no matter what is going wrong, no matter how hard it is to get a job, or, or even to get a degree, uh, you have, through sustainability, you have the option or the potential uh, for getting control of your life, of uh, doing things that will set you apart from the institutions that uh, may be exploitative. And so this has appealed to a lot of students. Uh, sustainability has become fashionable, even hip, in many areas. Now you might think that uh, this kind of activity would appeal to institutions and individuals who don't have much money and trying to cut back and save and live simply um, and uh, do a lot of efficient things that will make the box go further. Uh, but that's not the case at all. It's quite the opposite. And the leaders of this movement are the most selective universities, uh, which are usually the best healed and uh, have, uh, for the most part, very affluent students. So I consulted a list uh, that was compiled of the, the leading hundred institutions in this area, and I'll let me just go through a very few of them before we turn to the situation here in Wesley. The number one um, was uh, University of California at Davis, and a factoid here and there about all these. Uh, what that impressed me about Davis was that they claimed to have 20,000 bicycles on campus, uh, whereby the students who went to the place Number two, Georgia Tech, which claims to have 260 courses on sustainability that may be a case of over-specialization. <laughs> Three is Stanford, which has a number of programs, but including in that, in that list are organic gardens that the students run. And uh, you can imagine what the popular crops that they grow. <laughs> it's not the one you were thinking of, it's barley, which as you may know is the most ingredient in beer. Uh, number four, University of Washington, five, University of Connecticut, six, University of He's all had a lab. Number seven is Duke, uh, which has uh, pledged to itself to climate neutrality, uh, which, uh, I think, in 2015. In other words, doing things that will neutralize whatever carbon footprint they're creating. Uh, number eight is Yale, which has 14 LEED certified buildings, which you may know is a very, very elaborate and complicated and expensive a way of assessing uh, physical structures so that they are. Uh, energy efficient and so on. Number nine is University of California at Irvine, which among other things, and I can point this out because it'll come up later, they have hydration stations. And uh, number 10 is Appalachian State, the first group of what we might call second echelon uh, schools in this group. So they're all these are all very selective places uh, that, that are the leaders. And let me just quickly go through the next group, and you see it becomes a little more varied as we go along. Uh, Green Mountain College and the Modest Home Liberal Arts College, uh, University of South Florida, a large public university, University of Oregon, again, a large public University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, um, medium sized uh, public university, Grand Valley State in Michigan, a uh, fairly small public university, University of uh, California in San Diego, very large. Uh, Harvard, large private, Warren Wilson College, a very small federal arts college in North Carolina, and University of California, Berkeley, if you can imagine a more dramatic contrast between those two. Now, in Ohio, the, the leader has been, over the last decade or so, Oberlin College, uh, which in this ranking came in at number 30, which is uh, surprisingly low considering what they have done. But the influence of Oberlin extends beyond whatever they at the present time, or very likely to be able to do in the future. And that's due to the presence there of a professor of environmental studies and politics named David Moore. And uh, David's a really a dynamic guy who is uh, uh, a whirlwind of activity. And he, uh, his interest is in uh, design and uh, architectural uh, technique and so on. And about 15 years ago, in the mid-1990s, he went to the president of the school and said, uh, I want to build a building for the Environmental Studies Program that would be the absolutely the most advanced in the world. 
in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of uh, recycling, and so on. And the president said, great, except that you don't dare contact any of our alums or the other people that we raise money from, because we have, <laughs> our, we've already got our hands in their pockets, and, uh, and there just isn't enough room. And so he said, OK, and he went out and he raised the five or seven million dollars that they spent on this building, which was completed in 2001. And it is really, uh, even today, it's, it's uh, quite dramatic and spectacular. And if you have an occasion to go there, and you might tour the building, it's, it's uh, really quite impressive. And it was much more impressive uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, it has its, uh, all the windows face south so that they have uh, a passive solar heating and light. They have a, a parking lot next to the, the building and there's a, a covered a, a roof on a parking lot with their solar panels. They have uh, all the water that they use was used in the building is recycled through a garden and so on. And they have a lot of other things. It's, it's really quite interesting. It has become a prototype for lots of other buildings. And I know in the area where I live, there are at least three that are very similar to that, which have been built in the last few years. Now David is working on what he calls the Overland Project, and what he terms full spectrum sustainability. No, no uh, uh, pussyfooting anymore. Uh, and uh, so he wants to involve the entire town in, in this project. And how this is going to happen, I don't know, but he's out uh, raising a lot more money. There are a lot of other colleges in Ohio in this area that have also embraced this in one fashion or another. Uh, let me just mention one other. Uh, the College of Worcester uh, has a very interesting program, among others. Uh, there's a, a little stream that flows through the campus, <coughs> and a lot of the water from the parking lots flow, uh, 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 goes into that stream and uh, carries with it a lot of the pollutants from, the, the, from automobiles and so on. And so uh, a professor in the chemistry department there had uh, invented a, an absorbent material that will take all of this stuff out of the polluted water. And so they're in the process of creating a whole series of rain gardens along the stream with, with this material which will uh, clean and purify water. So that's the kind of, uh, kind of thing that's going on around us. Now I'm going to turn to uh, Wesley in here, and Peter's going to help. Uh, he's been involved in this activity. And uh, I have a list of categories that, that Sean sent me uh, of things that they have done, things that they're working on, or things that have been completed. And I'll go through these categories and then Peter can jump in with, with uh, an embellishment on the uh, outline that I have. And then if there's any time left, uh, you can uh, uh, ask me, or ask, that perhaps better yet, ask Peter uh, to elaborate some more. Number one is energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, they have, uh, in the last few years, they have changed the lighting in all the dormitories. I suppose um, with uh, ins installing LED lights or you know, compact fluorescents or and, and a lot of motion sensors uh, too, so that the lights uh, are not uh, on when, when people are not using the rooms. They have, I suppose, uh, programmable uh, thermostats uh, in, in most areas, which is another common. Uh, device for uh, reducing energy consumption. And uh, this extends to public, public, public buildings uh, like the library and this building, as well as uh, the dormitories. Uh, so the second area is water conservation. Uh, they inst have installed the low flow shower heads and faucet aerators in all the dormitories and, and uh, you notice it in the restroom here. But, uh, but in, in most of the parts of the uh, campus, they've installed dual flush toilets in all the women's bathrooms. Um, I think there is the other half of the project that's still in the <laughs> um, And uh, the results are, I mean, these fairly simple but obvious things are, are pretty evident. Um, according to Sean, the payback for the expenses that, that, that they incurred in, in making these changes, the payback was in eight weeks. And they're saving about five or six gallons of water a year. Five or six million gallons of water a year at a cost of about $60,000. So they, they, this is a good example of this efficiency dimension uh, where, where it is possible to, to, to 
to have what you have and, and even improve on it and save a lot of money at the same time. A third area is uh, <coughs> waste diversion, where they are um, trying to uh, reuse and recycle uh, uh, furniture, for example, or other items on the campus. And, uh, and uh, he was talking about the some department, for example, will buy some new, say, equipment, and they won't know that somebody else could use that, and so they would throw it away instead, they provide a mechanism whereby they, they find out about this sort of thing, and then uh, can we use that and not purchase new equipment for, for everyone? Um, one of the uh, one of the things that I was most I thought was most interesting and provides us a with a, with a perspective on college life that, that is quite alien to those of us of many years ago. And here I have, I have a photograph, which I will pass around. Um, it's, they have uh, uh, college students today, when I was graduated, I probably had a suitcase and a couple of books, and that was it, and I was ready to leave. And today, but that's not true. Today, you can't be a college student sort of minimalist. Uh, you, you have to have a variety of appliances in your room. Uh, you have to have, uh, obviously, computers and printers and all that sort of thing. So it, it becomes uh, capital intensive. And, uh, and typically, the, when the seniors would get ready to leave, they would just get a big dumpster. All this stuff would go in there because they didn't want to cart it home wherever they were going to go after that. And so I guess it was Sean's idea or Sean and Peter's idea that they would they would uh, make this available if it's in good shape to the people who are coming along in the subsequent years and who would be buying exactly the same things. And so they established, a, I think it's called a give and take store. They basically collected these things, went through it, saved the stuff that was good, and then uh, set up this store in a building and that these students who were coming back the next year could go there and without charge, uh, take whatever they wanted to outfit their rooms so they could have um, a full spectrum of appliances and paraphernalia that, that you would find essential if you were a modern day college student. You want to elaborate on that here? Yeah, this is, uh, this is something called the free store. Um, <clears throat> and it's been wildly successful for the past two years. So. The, the, the amount of material that is thrown into dumpsters all over campus when students move out is just unbelievable. We put a large 30 yard dumpster in every dormitory. Before we started this, those things were always full by the time the students had fully moved out. Of course, they didn't want to take their stuff up and throw it there. We had to go in the rooms very often. <laughs> so, this has been successful on a lot of fronts. Number one, between that and another initiative of composting and food waste, we, we diverted for recycling efforts of paper and that type of thing. We're diverting uh, something like 54% of the solid waste that's going to be landfill away from the landfill. So <clears throat> a big part of that is this, is this restore idea. Uh, and uh, Sean has, has driven a man around for the week before he went for 80 and, and just designated an area in all of these residence halls where people could leave things that uh, they didn't want to haul out to the, to the, the dumpsters. And, after we got through a couple of glitches uh, last year, it's worked ex extremely well this year. Televisions, cameras, clothing, food, cleaning supplies, all kinds of stuff. And that's locked up over the summer. And within about two weeks, when students get back, it's all gone. Uh, uh, also, it eliminates a fair amount of dumpster bagging on campus from the old people that are you know, <laughs> exploring the treasure trove that's left behind. So that's been a very, very uh, successful that, uh, that Sean has brought to us, and uh, uh, that's it's, it's worked very well. Can you tell us a little more about the food uh, uh, um, In my former institution, we had all you can eat dining hall. We pretty much had one facility. Okay, so people were there, were, there was no disincentive to waste food. Um, we had trays that, that uh, people would use, kind of like the old animal house movie. <laughs> piling stuff on, I guess, with the intention of having food from there. Um, 
sustainable practices sort of normal on campus. But everybody gets tired of chasing Oberlin, you know. And uh, here we have an opportunity to put in or to be the beneficiary of a city project that puts in four megawatts of electrical power. Uh, our total demand on campus is four megawatts. So what we do is, is, is partner with the city to do what's called a power purchase agreement. And that scenario, an uh, outside energy investor comes in and buys all the equipment, installs it. And in this case, it would be a 14-acre landfill site across the across 23 here. Of course, we have a big sign that says joint venture with High um, Wesley and the city of Delaware. Uh, and for a negotiated price that's attractive to us, that is better than what we could do buying electricity from the utility. We, for 15 years, buy the electricity that that solar field generates. And we buy half of it, and the uh, uh, city of Delaware buy half of it. And Overland's trying to do the same thing, but they're only two megawatts, so we get to take the lead. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a very, very exciting opportunity that we have here. It's, it's very, it's very early uh, in, the, in the process. There's a lot of questions that we have to ask and answer, and a lot of problems to solve. But it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity that we're looking into. And uh, then um, another part of this program is uh, community engagement. Uh, and, uh, recruited students to help with this. They're going out talking to various businesses uh, to encourage them to do the same kinds of things. And uh, 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 so the students are getting practical experience in, in, uh, in communication and uh, uh, promoting uh, the kind of activities that, that uh, are well underway here. So that is uh, a brief summary of, of what they Uh, 
uh, and they use that system of, of pipe to uh, instead set hot water around, uh, leave uh, that, I don't know the technical details very well, but they serve an sort of entire campus with the largest geothermal uh, system of any campus in the United States is just next door, so I intend to go over here and look at that. Well, okay, so Yeah, I know that the folks in us will do an awful lot, but I think one of the, there's this thing called the President's Climate Initiative. Have you heard this? This is the, the sort of two of the schools in this area. In fact, this is what brought us to, to hire Shaw the sustainability program. President Clinton uh, uh, challenged college presidents all over the United States to become climate control by some, I don't know, 2025, 2050, something like that. And <clears throat> to come up with plans to uh, look at all of of the outputs in terms of CO2 to the campus and then try to move carbon neutral. When you start looking at that, what you learn is that the vast majority of CO2 is produced on college campus comes from the buildings. So the heating, the lighting, and especially the air conditioning in the buildings creates, you know, uh, requires a fair amount of energy and burns a, a fair amount of fuel. And in Ohio, it means burning a fair amount of coal and therefore all the CO2. <coughs> so we hired Sean to see if we wanted a signatory for that. And it turns out, as I think most of the schools in Ohio have learned, um, that getting all the way to climate neutral is a, is a very tall water. If you burn coal, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So one of the things that Oregon is doing is, is getting rid of the coal plant, as is Denison, as did, as did Worcester. Uh, we burn natural gas here, but even so, uh, to the, the biggest thing that we can do to approach that goal is to increase the efficiency of our buildings. And there's a fair amount of low-hanging fruit here. Like Sean learned when he assessed the lighting on campus, we still have T12 bulbs in some places. And um, <clears throat> he, he did an awful lot of very good work to put a motion sensor in a room like this so that whenever he leaves, the lights turn off. And there's there's now technology that will put a CO2 sensor in here. And whenever he leaves and the sensor doesn't sense anybody exhaling anymore, they feel that the, the, the computer tells the room to try to modulate the temperature because there's nobody here anymore. So there's all kinds of technology. The cloud-based stuff is, is revolutionized this whole thing. And we have techno technologies just for controlling buildings at our, at our fingertips that we didn't have before. We've got a lot of old buildings that need a fair amount of retro emission going back and tuning everything up. And probably installing <clears throat> much more energy efficient modern equipment. I think there's a six million dollar opportunity here to do that uh, and to to do what's known as a performance contract. Are you familiar with this? An energy saving performance contract? The idea is that that um, uh, you you identify you hire an engineering firm to come in and survey your campus, you identify all of the opportunities that you have to save energy. And you quantify that of the number of MCF gas and the number of kilowatts uh, uh, of electricity, look at the current prices, prices <clears throat> and then figure out how much you can annualize the savings that you can see by installing more efficient equipment. And it turns out here there's about a six million dollar cost to do all of these energy saving measures and will pay for itself in 15 years. And it will service the debt. This is the wonderful thing about it. You know, so you can borrow the 15 and the six million dollars and then the debt service every year is covered by the savings that you're <coughs> So it, it really is, if you do it right, you're smart about it, it's a no-cost operation to the, to, to the university. So this is one of my goals, is to try and uh, make the case for uh, doing that here, because the other big challenge that schools face, not only in Iowa Westland, all schools in the United States have a tremendous backlog for agreements, because <coughs> The buildings that were built after the Second World War, of which there were many, are all coming to an age when the major systems in the buildings are failing. So things need to be updated. And, and uh, like I say, we could spend, uh, I think at Worcester, we figured there was $50 million of deferred needs. I'm not sure if there's something like that here. And to take six of that out by getting it paid for and realize all these energy savings is really so again, I have to make the case to the administration and the 
prove that that, that uh, the savings are real. That's what I'll be working on in the next, say, two years. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I think most of that is just a window out, but I'm very familiar with the possibility of uh, the school year or the year. The biggest opportunity for wind is off the coastal lake area. Uh, and there's a, there's a, Last I heard, that's still in the process of the offshore wind farms, which we talked about up there. Uh, there are a couple of windmills, one-offs here, here and there uh, that I see. Uh, I think Denison's put a small windmill in there, in there uh, on their campus. Yeah, yeah. I've been the state of those two now that I think about it. No, I'm sorry, case was reserved sort of thing. Um, but there are issues. It, 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 the neighbors, you know, it does make some noise. Um, yeah, yeah. People, people think they're ugly. Um, yeah, they're very ugly. You know, I drive down from the strip every day, and, and uh, about once a week I see a truck and trailer with, with a blade in one of these things. Uh, <laughs> windows on it. And you know, they're not a regular truck, these things are just a mess. And, uh, I think to myself, they, my goodness, they can have that, I don't think they've cranked it, they wreck one of these things. So, uh, make a short story long.